So last week I gave a talk uh, on autonomy in the original Buddhism and at the end of the talk uh, somebody pointed out that uh, Lawrence is not here this evening on the statue uh, which welcomes you as you come into this place there was a saying there not to do any evil and uh, the Lawrence quite correctly and I really agree with him said why have you got that word evil because is that really part of Buddhism you know, evil and he was very correct evil is nothing to do with Buddhism at all now, the word does not exist in Buddhism there is no such thing as evil in Buddhism and I know that when uh, we had those 9-11 uh, and the Twin Towers and people going around saying no, those terrorists are evil and people actually asked me at that time, is there such a thing as evil in Buddhism? There's no such thing as evil in Buddhism, just stupidity, not evil. <laughs> and in fact, you can't even say that those people were stupid. Because again, there's no concept of a person being stupid in Buddhism. Or the only concept we have is that people who sometimes do stupid things. So it's far, far softer. So number one, there is no evil and in a sense that means that you'll never find like too many movies on Buddhist themes. We're far too boring. If you have evil and vampires and monsters who are totally corrupt and evil, it's far more exciting. And in fact with Buddhism where we don't have sex, we don't have violence, it's a very, very boring religion. So if you like excitement, you've come to the wrong place. But if you like peace, well done, you come to a good place. But we don't have evil, we have stupidity, and no one is stupid, just people do stupid things. And so the whole thrust of Buddhism, when it says you know, not to cultivate sort of stupidity, it, instead of that we cultivate sort of wisdom, understanding. And somebody did send me a request, can you read please today talk about sort of uh, what they call ignorance or delusion or stupidity and that is a central part of Buddhism but first of all I've already mentioned one important thing there is no such thing as evil, there's no such thing as stupidity it's just a temporary thing which some people do there is a story I haven't told for a long time now but which is in Opening the Door of Your Heart, that book which has been uh, translated in so many languages and it brings out the point of what I'm saying that sometimes that uh, we just don't see things correctly and that is what sort of stupidity is all about and this was an example of the two children at the supermarket checkout they were in parallel lanes and almost exactly the same time one child took out a carton of milk from the trolley and he dropped it on the ground and it went splat all over the floor making a whole mess and his mum said you stupid child almost exactly the same time in the parallel aisle another child they picked up the jar of honey and it was slippy, they dropped it and it went smash all over the floor but that mother, because she must come to the Buddhist society in Nolamara that mother, <laughs> she didn't say you stupid child she said that was a stupid thing you did and we emphasize the huge difference between those two responses now if you examine it you call that you stupid child it's as if they are totally stupid they are like totally sort of corrupt that when they were made there must be some genetic malfunction that they are actually stupid they're permanently stained with stupidity and that's that first child and many of you can recognize you know, such reactions when you make a mistake and someone calls you stupid, someone calls you dumb, someone calls you all these things and what they're saying is you're fatally flawed there's nothing worth redeeming in you and you know what it's like when that happens to you and then you feel totally diminished, totally hopeless you lose all your self-esteem and that's no way to bring up a child the other child received that was a stupid thing you did you're not a stupid kid 
but you know you had a moment of stupidity and what that means is you're recognizing the truth that was a sort of a, uh, a silly thing to do to pick up that uh, jar of honey with making all slippy uh, but you're not a stupid person there's more to you than that now this gives an idea of what wisdom is you know in Buddhism and many of you when you argue with each other at home you know in married life you know you know that old story in your first year of marriage in the first year of marriage the husband listens to the wife in the second year of marriage the wife listens to the husband in the third year of marriage the neighbors listen to both of you he's talking so <laughs> why are you laughing because <laughs> it's true isn't it but you know what it's like when people argue with each other you stupid husband you selfish woman you idiot there is no such person who's selfish there is no idiots there is no stupid people in this world it's just people who do stupid things people who do selfish things so the first bit of wisdom is that there is no one who is stupid what a great relief because that includes you there is just people who have moments of stupidity some people have many moments of stupidity <laughs> linked together almost continuous but you do have moments of wisdom each one of you do so it's wonderful to recognize that that each one of you you know has those moments of lucidity and wisdom so there's no such thing as evil but why is it that those moments of lucidity and wisdom aren't enough why our people you know sometimes act stupidly again and again and again and this is, was the main thrust of the the question which somebody asked me to talk about why is it we just don't see one of the reasons is because it's not encouraged you know, to see too many people are lazy so they just want to be told what to believe and that's why sometimes you come to this place to be told what to believe to be told what the law of karma is to be told what you're supposed to do to be told this and to be told that and I'm actually failing in my duty if I tell you what to do many years ago I made the statement I said be careful don't believe what I say and straight away people believe what I just said <laughs> in other words the purpose of a religion like Buddhism is not to tell you what to believe but tell you how to find out so it's a path rather than a truth which is given to you you have to do that work so wisdom is not something which you learn just from listening to a talk it's not something you get from reading a book it's what you get by doing the work of investigating, contemplating, looking very deeply into the nature of yourself, of relationships and into life. You have to do the work. And that's one of the reasons why it's tough being a Buddhist. It's great in other religions. You're just told what to believe. You don't need to do the work. Someone else has done the work for you. God has found out the truth. So you just have to believe what God says. As long as God has found the truth, what happens if God was stupid? and he's telling you things which don't exist so be careful you know sometimes even God makes mistakes there's this old story I'm just going into jokes now because it's a hot evening <laughs> this old story of, of again I don't think I've told this for over a year and many of you are old enough now your memory is going so I can repeat the jokes as long as it's not too recently <laughs> I don't know if you heard but you know there's a lot of interfaith work being done and a lot of Reproachment was being done recently between the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. And you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Anglican Church, actually visited the Pope in Rome. But you may not know that they decided to have you know, uh, some time by themselves so they could actually just meet with each other and have personal time to have this trust between each other. So they both had a game of golf together. And as they were playing golf, they sort of were saying, Well, look you know that we both believe in God and you now God is all-powerful so let's make a resolution whoever wins this game of golf or rather whoever loses it has to convert to the other's religion so if the Archbishop loses he has to become a Catholic if the Pope loses he has to become a Protestant 
fair enough. Let God decide on a game of golf. So the stakes were that high. And as they came to the last hole, the Pope was a couple of shots ahead. He just needed to sink this putt and he'd win by two shots. And of course, the stakes being so high, he asked his caddy, you know what the Catholic Church is like, the caddy was a nun. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble with this again. I always get into trouble, but look, I'm not stupid, I'm not evil, I just sometimes do stupid things and tell stupid stories. But <laughs> anyway, so the, the, <laughs> the caddy, the nun, gave him, gave him a putter and he lined it up and he hit it. And you may have seen on the TV, if you don't actually play golf yourself, it rimmed the hole. It didn't go in, it just went past, you know, a couple of feet past. And so, you know, he, he missed a shot, but still, sink the next putt. And he did, oh, I forgot to say, that when he missed the hole, you know, because he was a bit tense, he actually swore. He said, damn it, missed. And at that, that, that you know, the nun heard it and said, no, your, your em what do you call a pope? Your eminence, your holiness? Well, anyway, whatever you call it, your popiness. Okay, we're in big trouble, but be careful. <laughs> your eminence or whatever is, you shouldn't swear. You know, he said, damn, that's a bad word. And you know, he said, I'm, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. You know, it's just the heat of the moment. So he had another part and he would still win, you know, by one shot. And he hit that one and again, you know what it's like, he's so excited. He hit that and he went another two foot past the hole. He missed it a long way. He said, damn it, missed. And the nun crossed herself and said, look, you're tempting fate. You know, a person in your position, you shouldn't say things like that. He said, I'm totally sorry. It was just so important I sank that putt. Now if I don't sink this one, I'm going to have to convert to being a Protestant. And so he was so nervous, he hit that putt. It went straight for the hole. But it wasn't hard enough. It stopped just a millimeter in front of the hole. And again, he swore, damn it, missed. And before the, the nun finished crossing herself, there was a thunderbolt from heaven, this big roar. And the thunderbolt, the bolt of lightning, hit the nun. <laughs> and she fell down dead. <laughs> Nuns always get it, don't they? <laughs> and this big roar came out from heaven. Damn it, missed. <laughs> from God. So see, even God makes mistakes sometimes, so you can't trust anything, can you? <laughs> so the wonderful thing about uh, Buddhism is that we have to find out for ourselves. Wisdom is not something which you just get from listening to a talk. It's not something you get from a book. It's something which you have to find out for yourself. And so basically 99% of Buddhism is actually t teaching you how to find out for yourself. And the first thing is, is sometimes you have to challenge to be able to find out. So questioning is more important than just blind faith. Which is why we encourage those questions. And you know, I encourage them so much, it's really hard to find those questions, that when I give talks overseas, we have much more time for questions and answers. I know what it's like sometimes, you know, you finish a talk, are there any questions? A lot of times just people just stare at you, they've got no questions, at least that's what they say. So it's very hard to actually get a question out of anybody. So I have this little technique which seems to always work to get questions out of people when I go overseas. I tell them some traditional Buddhism. Now you know that part of Buddhism is a law of karma and reincarnation or rebirth, so I tell them this is actually from the, the Mahakama Vibhanga Sutra. You know, it's one of the sutras of the Buddha in the Majjhima And there they tell the story of this man who came up to the Buddha and asked him like a question on karma. He was saying, you know, I've noticed in this world some people are just born wealthy and they manage to maintain that wealth and increase it. Now other people are born poor and sometimes they get wealthy, but you know there's some people, they, they're poor, they work really hard and they try very hard and they work just all hours of the night and still it's just so hard to make ends meet. You know, that why can't you be wealthy? While other people, they seem to work much less than you, they just got the gift of you know, making money. They said, there must be some karma from a past life that we're born poor in this life. 
So he was asked, what do I do in this, what do I have to do in this life? What karma do I have to make in this life to be rich in my next life? And it's a fair enough question. And so the Buddha gave him an answer and he was so happy with it, he asked a second question. He said, now I've also noticed that sometimes people are very beautiful while other people are ugly. And you may notice when I mentioned the word ugly, I stared at the carpet. And the reason for this, the reason for this is I told a story in Singapore once and I, I, just, I just happened to be looking at a certain woman when I mentioned the word ugly. <laughs> and my goodness, did she complain. She said, why did you mention the word ugly when you're looking at me? <laughs> and it's even worse if I mention the word beautiful when I'm looking at someone, they get the wrong idea. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> he, he, um, the Buddha explained the cause for beauty and ugliness in your next life. But then the killer question, why are some people intelligent and other people they just have such a hard time at school and university? Now you've been with some people, they hardly do any of the homework, they just float through school, they get the prizes and they go to universities, they get double firsts. Uh, you know, for the rest of us it's just so hard just, you know, just getting the TEE pass. So I said, why is it? What's the karmic reason why people are born intelligent and other people aren't intelligent? What's a karmic cause? And the Buddha said, and this was a beautiful answer, the karmic reason for stupidity in your next life is not asking questions in this life. It's a very beautiful answer and I always get a question afterwards. <laughs> but it's, the Buddha is actually saying the cause of intelligence, the cause of wisdom is actually questioning and investigating. Not just sitting here and just soaking it all in but questioning, asking those difficult questions, investigating, digging deeper into things. And that's why it's always encouraged in Buddhism to ask those questions. And in fact, the very last teaching of my master, Ajahn Chah, before he stopped teaching at all, I remember this, he would, I can't imitate it correctly, he would get his hands out and he'd imitate a crab with a lame leg. And so once there was a crab with a wonky leg and it always walked with a limp and it told its little baby crabs, he said, look, I've got a bad leg, that's why I walk with a limp. Don't you walk like me? But all the baby crabs also walk with a limp, just like their mummy. <laughs> they were just sheep. And he said, don't do that. And this is the problem with many, many people that you know that you know if i if you like have a limp you now my wisdom is not so perfect as the buddha's so don't just be a clone of someone like me think for yourselves investigate for yourself another of my favorite sayings is when everybody thinks the same no one thinks at all if you want to use that and write that on your your office wall where everyone thinks the same no one thinks at all the whole purpose of Buddhism is actually stopping that stupidity of just everybody thinking the same. You know, it's much tougher being a teacher when people question you and they argue with you. But you know, I wouldn't have that any other way. If people didn't question me and argue with me from time to time, I get very concerned that I'm not doing my job. The whole purpose of Buddhism is to find that wisdom and the only way to do that is asking the questions, going deep and not just being just an imitator, just like that mother crab and all the baby crabs also walking with limps. So this is not a faith tradition, not a belief tradition. It, it, it requires a lot of work from you to be wise. And when you're wise, you actually you, you tend to see things in a unique and different way, not the way everybody else sees it. Which is why to be wise you have to be a bit rebellious. I remember many years ago people told me in IBM, this was when I was young. Everybody had to wear a suit and a tie and be well groomed. Everybody except the people in research and development. The more weird and eccentric they were, the better their job prospects were. Because they realized in research and development, in creativity, you had to be a bit eccentric and weird to see things which no one else had seen. In other words, to be wise. Not just to repeat what other people had done, but to take knowledge further. And that took a lot of eccentricity and also it took a lot of courage. One of the biggest reasons for stupidity is fear. We don't have the courage 
enough to sort of let go of the past ideas we've had to see things differently. We're just too comfortable sometimes in our old ways of looking at things, in our old ideas. So great teachers actually challenge you. They challenge you to see things in a totally different way. And that's one of the, the most exciting, interesting, but sometimes fearful things which you can do, especially when you become a monk. You let go of everything and put yourself in these situations when everything you knew and understood was totally challenged. You know, I did have a good education. I did come from this Cambridge University. And I went into monastic life thinking I was so clever and intelligent <laughs> until I met real intelligent people. Intelligent people who knew much more than I did. They didn't know sort of theoretical physics, but they certainly knew the nature of the mind and how it worked and how to deal with it, especially in difficult situations. They had real wisdom. Now remember, a place like Cambridge, you were hanging out with Nobel laureates, you know, with professors who were incredibly brilliant in their field, but stupid in life. And I realized that that wasn't real intelligence. But when you went to places like, you know, to see these, and these old monks, they were wise. And in situations which normally would challenge people, they had this wisdom, this insight into the nature of the human mind which worked so many times. One example, which I will never forget, this is of my master, was a person who came to his temple possessed. At least that's what the villagers said. Just early in the morning, the headman and his assistant came into the monastery and told Ajahn Chah that there was a woman in their village who had been possessed by some spirit, by some demon the night before. And they were totally crazy. They had been trying to deal with her all night. And they could not. So they were bringing her to see this great monk, Ajahn Chah. Now of course in Thailand they don't have a pet team. They don't have psychiatrists. It's actually the monks who are the psychiatrists in those days. We are the ones, you know, who have the psychological uh, wherewithal to deal with such problems. And so, they were bringing this lady into this monastery and as they were bringing her in, you could actually hear her screams, even though it was a long way away. But when people are crazy, I mean they scream in such a loud voice and they scream profanities, even in like a temple. And you know how devout Thai people are around their monks and their monasteries, but this lady was out of her head. And of course, what did Ajahn Chah do, our great master? He just ordered these two novices Dig a hole, I want a big hole dug. And another couple of novices, boil some water, I want some boiling water, lots of boiling water. And I began to wonder who was the mad person, you know, this lady being dragged to the monastery of Ajahn Chah, because I couldn't understand what the heck he was doing. You don't sort of treat a person, you know, with, who's mad by digging a hole and boiling some water. What's he going to do, give her a cup of tea? And, as she was coming closer, Ajahn Chah was very sort of fierce with the novices. Come on, I need a hole dug quickly, and I need more water, lots of water, boil heaps of water. And again, we didn't know what he was up to. I couldn't figure this guy out. And when they brought this woman to him, you know, it was this classic case. You know, she was literally foaming at her mouth, and she was so crazy and so powerful with her madness that you know, these were you no know, tough northeast Thai farmers, and they had about four, or four, three or four of them holding her down, and they were just that's all they could do to keep her from sort of lunging at Ajahn Chah. And then he led on what he was up to. He told the villagers, "This is a very, very dangerous demon who's got into this woman. The only thing we can do to help her is put her in this hole." Pour boiling water over her, heaps, and then bury her alive. It's too dangerous a demon. And that's what he said. He was going to pour all this boiling water over this lady and bury her alive. Now, you know, you think that people just don't do this. But Ajahn Chah was so eccentric, so unique, I thought actually he might do this. <laughs> and certainly this girl thought he might do this. And she started calming down. 
Before the water was boiled and the hole was dug, she was sitting in front of him, as calm as anything, receiving the Buddhist no precepts, exhausted, and after giving the precepts, they calmly took her home. Now that was wisdom. Because what Ajahn Chah understood, whether that was a demon inside of you, or whether that was just a, a psychotic attack, there is something deep inside each one of us called self-preservation. And if you really thought that if you don't get your act together and that get it together quickly, you're going to have boiling water poured all over you and, and buried in a hole, you get better pretty quickly. <laughs> and that's what Ajahn Chah saw, this, this self-preservation. And that was some sort of wisdom which can never be repeated. No one can repeat that. It was unique to that time, to that situation. And my goodness, how powerful it worked. No need for any injections of any chemicals or medication. Just incredible, powerful wisdom. And how well it worked. And I see him do this so many times, and it really showed me just the power of wisdom. Stupidity would be, you know, you may be a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and someone comes into your rooms, psychotic, and you go and order your secretary, dig a hole, boil some, some water. It won't work because you're just being just like that baby crab. You can't repeat wisdom. It's not something you learn and just repeat. That is one of the problems with our caring professions. You now we always think, oh, what do I do in such a situation when someone comes up to me with a schizophrenic episode? What do I do when they come up with a cancer? What do I do? Look, don't just look in the sort of the manuals, what worked before and think it's going to work again. We all know that every human being is totally unique, every disease is unique, every problem is unique, there's never going to be another problem like that. So instead of just repeating what you're supposed to do, instead we develop this incredible Buddhist wisdom. So we actually see what needs to be done, rather than just believe in what happened in the past, just like a person who believes in a book and has faith in some sort of book. It may have worked in the past, but it's not going to work now. So how do we actually develop that Buddhist wisdom? And of course, as many of you know, it means just erasing your mind of all that past knowledge. As I said last week, never allow knowledge to stand in the way of truth. Never allow your learning, what you think you should do, to stand in what you know should be done. So you feel it rather than think it. The problem with our Western world, what makes us really stupid, is because we think too much. And we have this assumption that by thinking it out, working it through logically, we're going to find a wise answer. And I think you've all been thinking a lot for so many years, and has that ever really sort of helped you at all? Has it really gave you wisdom at all? There are people who have trained their thinking far more than I've ever done. The great philosophers, the really great intellectuals, and I've known a few of them, and they're all to a person pretty stupid. Or rather, I shouldn't say that, they do stupid things, but a lot of the time. To be consistent to what I said at the beginning of this, this, uh, this uh, talk. I mean, this, the answer to how to be wise is in the old story of the the famous philosopher in Japan many, many years ago. He was a professor not just of one university, of several universities. And he was so well known, uh, he was the, you know, the biggest intellectual in the country. And just for a bit of fun, but also for a bit of intellectual stimulation, he would hold these debates with all the other philosophers. But he was so sharp, he was so knowledgeable, that no person would enter into a debate with him, because he would always win. And so wondering who to debate next, he thought, I will debate a Buddhist monk. They're so safe to be wise, but they're really stupid, he thought. I'll go and debate the most famous monk in the country, and see who wins. And so he found this monk, this meditation monk, and he arranged to have a debate with this monk, and so he went to the monastery with all of his students to debate with this monk. And being in Japan, before the debate actually started, it was the task of the host, the monk, to serve tea to the guests, the professor. And as he was serving tea to the professor, he poured the tea into the cup 
and when the cup was full, he carried on pouring, and so the water went into the saucer. At which point the professor said to the monk, my cup is full, you can stop now. But the monk carried on pouring until it went over the cup, into the saucer, over the saucer, onto the table. At which point the professor thought, this monk must be a bit hard of hearing of, or a bit blind. So he shouted, monk, my cup is full, you can stop now. At which point the monk smiled broadly and emptied the whole teapot until it went not just over the cup into the saucer, not just over the saucer onto the table, but onto the floor as well. At which point the professor said, you stupid monk, I've come all this way to debate with you and you don't even know how to serve a cup of tea. What an idiot, what a fool, I've wasted my whole time. At which point the monk said, if you haven't heard this story before, and it's a great story, he said, professor, you are just like this cup. You are so full that no one can pour, pour any wisdom into you. At which point the professor went down on his knees and said, you've won. <laughs> Because that's a trouble with professors, and each one of you professors, aren't you? Sometimes, sometimes we're so full that someone pours any more in, and it can't go in, it just goes out. So the moral of that story is, to be wise, you have to be empty. To empty all your past knowledge, so you can see things from a different angle. See things freshly, with an empty, peaceful, still mind. And that is why we have the core practice in Buddhism is not learning what somebody said, not memorizing things. It's not actually just listening and being brainwashed and taking things on faith. The core teaching is learning how to meditate to make your mind so peaceful and still you can see things in a different way. It can be actually free from the past to see what's really happening in the present. Yeah, we don't see what's really there, we see what we want to see. And a good example of that, one of my funny stories, is night, this evening, many people will be out at the nightclubs, or maybe if they're a bit wealthier, they may be on these candlelit dinners, or you know, maybe just after dinner, they may be having a walk, it's a beautiful warm night, maybe by the river, under the starlight. Because those are the romantic places of our world. But why do we call such places romantic? If you want a romantic evening, where do you go? Those are the three main places, like you know, a nightclub or a, a candlelit restaurant or a walk by the river in the moonlight. You know why they are romantic? Have you noticed they all share one thing in common? They are all dark, because when it's dark, you can't really see whom you're falling in love with. <laughs> you don't really want to see who you're falling in love with, do you? Because <laughs> you know you'd be disappointed. <laughs> it's one of the reasons no one falls in love in the middle of the day. <laughs> it's always the night time. And why do people do that? They do that because they want to believe that their partner is like, oh, what's his name, Justin Bieber? <laughs> I got this, I was in Singapore and I said, who's the hottest guy these days, Justin Bieber? They, they want to uh, look at their girl, it's, it's Megan, no, it's, was it, no, no, not Megan, Gale, somebody else. Morgan, I forget, I just I don't watch these things, but who's the hottest girl these days? And, and, and say, your wife, your wife, well, my wife. <laughs> but you want to, we want to think that the girl in front of us is just this beautiful bimbo, whatever you call it. <laughs> and that's why we go out at night time, because in that night time, in the moonlight, you know, in the candle, like when the candle plays on her face, it gives delusion, full freedom <laughs> to make up what you want to see. <laughs> Now this, is, <laughs> now this is actually why we're deluded. Because we want to, we, our wisdom is not what's really out there, but what we really want to see. Now I'm not sort of putting down sort of relationships or putting down marriage, but you'll find relationships and marriage do much better when they're based on truth and honesty. You know, when you realize who that person is and who you are, 
and realize neither of you are perfect. And in fact, if you were perfect, it would be no reason to love each other. It's because of imperfections. That's why we love each other. Because I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. That's why this beautiful love is very sweet and wonderful. It's easy to love someone who's perfect, but to love what someone who's got all these faults. There's something beautiful in that. There's something selfless. There's something which is letting go of your desire for perfection. There's something which is true to the nature of our world, which is the world is not perfect, but we can still love it. You're not perfect, but you can be at peace with yourself. Your partner's not perfect, never will be, but you can still find peace and happiness there. Now you can understand well, if you're honest, there is a possibility for happiness, love, freedom, the whole works. But it's a dishonesty which stops us. And it's a dishonesty in the relationship which creates all the suffering in the relationship. If you're honest from the start, recognize your imperfections, recognize the other one's imperfections, and realize you know, they're not going to be changed, they're going to be there, accept that and celebrate it. Then we can find some happiness and peace in the world. I often say, living up on the hills in Serpentine, overlooking the ocean, sometimes there are some very glorious sunsets, but the best sunsets are always when there's a cloud in the sky, or when there's some dust from a, heavy from a hot day and a windy day. As it's the dust, it's the imperfections, which spread the light into these glorious crimsons and gold. When they're not there, the sunset isn't beautiful. It's imperfection which is the cause of beauty. It's imperfection which creates this beauty in our world. And I say that because even in the forests, in the forests the trees are never in rows and in lines. In our monastery, in our monasteries, there are no perfect trees. No trees which are totally straight with no limbs falling off. If they were perfect, we'd realize it would be a plantation, it would not be natural. In nature, the reason why it is beautiful is because of imperfection. That's what nature is. We come to be at peace and accept it and love it for that. So when our mind becomes very still and peaceful, instead of actually understanding what the world should be, what I should be, what forest should be, what sky should be, we have this wisdom which sees things as they truly are. This is nature, this is our world, this is us, this is uh, the world we're living in. And then we can find there is this possibility for acceptance, for peace, for love. Not love of the perfect, but love of the imperfect. So a lot of times what we say is delusion or stupidity is actually asking from the world something it will never give us. That's a, a great definition of pain and suffering. When you ask from the world what it will never be able to provide. When you ask from yourself what you can never give. When you ask from your partner or from your relationship what it will never ever be able to supply. That's called suffering. That is a moment of stupidity. So real wisdom, when you let go of everything you've been told, when your mind becomes very peaceful, when you see things truly, you, know, you realize that the world is not the problem. It's the way we've been relating to it is the problem. Stupidity is just a dysfunctional relationship we have with ourselves, with the world, and with others. It's nothing to do with what's right, which is what's wrong. It's nothing to do with some ultimate truth. It's just totally to do with a dysfunctional relationship. So when we realize that it's all about the relationship we have with ourselves, the relationship we have uh, with our partners, the relationship we have with life, then we realize that where wisdom is, is not in me, it's not in a text, it's not in you. Wisdom is in the space between us. That's where wisdom lies. Which is why that in one of the great so little stories of wisdom, which again didn't come from a Buddhist text. We don't need to sort of say that Buddhist has a whole franchise on wisdom. 
This actually came from that story from, uh, from Leo Tolstoy. It was one of those moments of wisdom when I read this story, which again rocked me for days. I remember when I first read this as a student and just spinning out for a couple of days when I thought, my goodness, I'd seen things in a totally wrong way, now I understand. And it changed a lot of the way that I looked at my life, if not the whole of my life. And that was that story of the Emperor's Three Questions. It's a very a long story told by Tolstoy, but it boils down to, and again this is, goes back to my talk last week of the autonomy uh, which uh, religions should be giving you, there was an emperor who uh, was fed up with organized religions. None of it made sense to him. And all the people teaching those religions were so hypocritical, they told him to do things they didn't do themselves. So he rejected uh, organized religions. And being an emperor he thought, why don't I find my own religion? So he got the wise people, the impressive people, he talked with them, he investigated, and he finally came down to his three questions, thinking, if only I could find the answer to these three questions, I'd have all the religion and spirituality which I needed in my life. And the three questions were, when is the most important time, who is the most important person, and the what is the most important thing to do. The when, the who, the what. Now I know that many of you have heard this story before, but there are many people who haven't heard this story before. And those who haven't heard this story before, I want you to think about those three questions and what you think the answers are. If you've heard the, the story before, please don't spoil my fun, be quiet. Because <laughs> there's a point to this. So, those were the Emperor's three questions. He eventually found the answers in an unexpected source. But what are the answers? When is the most important time? Christmas time? Waysack? Friday evening when you finish work? When is the most important time? Come on. Now. Right, exactly. It's the most important time. So when should you say sorry? <laughs> Now, so turn around and say sorry to your partner for what you've done. When is the most important time to say you love your parents? Now, please don't wait till tomorrow or this evening. Because you know what happens, so often it happens that you know, you, the moment passes. You don't have that opportunity you know, to say how much you care for someone. You find they're dead or they've gone overseas. Now that, you may think that that's you know, such a, a simple and obvious answer. But if you practice that, if you take that on as one of the most important parts of your life that now really is the most important time, it really is, you'll find that your relationship to others, your relationship to life will totally change. For many people now is not the most important time. We sacrifice too many moments of now getting things out of the way and then I'll be happy. And for many people now, it's not really important. That's why we get so old and all the things we should have done, we find we haven't done. Now is the most important time, but the second question is the best. Who is the most important person? Yeah, can I hear you? Ah, oh, you're spoiling it, you've read it before. <laughs> Most people when I say this, and they haven't heard it before, they all say themselves. Which is a wrong answer. We're in a, such a self-centered society, we always think that I am the most important person in the world. Which is totally wrong. And the answer, that's what I thought first of all, because that's what I've been taught. Come on, you're important, you make sure that you get what you want, and your relationship, you know, what satisfies you, your job which you really want, what you really deserve in life, you go for it, you go and get it, you're really important. But the answer is, someone suggested, was the person you're with, the one in front of you, is the most important person in the world. And as soon as I heard that, you know, this is what I mean by wisdom. You understand it. Why didn't I see that before? It is important. So whoever is in front of you, they are the most important person in the world, given that importance. 
And of course, as soon as I point that out, you know what I'm talking about, because how many times have you been talking with your partner and they've been ignoring you? They're not giving you a sense of importance. They're trying to get rid of you. I remember just when I was a student, this is when I read this story for the first time. Sometimes at the end of a lecture, I'd gone up to the, the lecturer to ask a question. He wasn't listening to me, he was just trying to get rid of me. I was just a small, hairy, insignificant student. He had better things to do. And that was a terrible feeling, that you know, you were asking a question and the other person was just trying to get rid of you. You weren't important to them. And that, if you, that happens to you too many times, you live, lose all your self-esteem, you get depressed. And you don't need to do that. So ever since I read that, and when I become a monk, one of the core practices which I really try hard to, to, to live by, is even though I may be really tired and you come up after the talk and you want to ask a question, you are really important to me. I don't try and get rid of you, even if I'm really tired, because I try and practice, if you're right in front of me and I'm talking to you, you are the most important person in the world. And it's important for that. And there are many times in your life you're by yourself, and of course then, who are you with? You're with yourself. And then you're really important. So important, as I said here before, whenever I go to bed at night, the last person I say good night to is myself. And I say that, good night me, have a great night, see you in the morning. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, hi, good morning, here I am again. Have a great day, me. And that's, that, that's not a joke, I do that. I'm not crazy. <laughs> and that actually just, is just showing that I'm important to me. Instead of just, you know, you're not really important. So just sacrifice yourself for the company, for your partner, for your kids, for other people. No, don't do that. So when you're by yourself, you are the most important person in the world. When you're with somebody, they're the most important person. And the last question, what's the most important thing to do? It's an obvious Buddhist answer, is to care. To care for yourself, to care for others. And I mentioned last week how important that is. Caring is much more important than keeping people alive. Someone came to see me today that they were very sort of upset that uh, in their um, apartment block, sort of in Perth, uh, somebody jumped from the balcony last week and uh, committed suicide. And they were asking, so is that a wrong thing to do, a bad thing to do? What's happened to them? And the details were, it was an 84-year-old man who the week before had lost his wife. They'd been married about 60 years. And suddenly he was, didn't have a partner anymore. The person who'd been with him, like they said, like joined at the hip for so many years. And so he decided to jump off the balcony and take his life. Was that a wrong thing to do? Now your knowledge would say, that's suicide, that's bad. But remember what I've been talking about this evening. Put that aside, never allow your knowledge to stand in the way of truth. What your head says is that suicide, that's bad, we should have counseled him or did something, given him some injection or some medicine to stop him doing that. But is that really caring for him? Is that really compassionate? There's something inside of me which respects life, but which respects compassion even more. And there was a guy who had a broken heart, 84 years of age, he'd lived a long life. And he'd lost someone, he just wanted to go back to her. I believe in reincarnation, it happens. So there's something sweet in that. And I mentioned that. To me, I can understand and never criticize a guy who does something like that. It's understandable. It was his way of caring. And it's not up to me to judge that at all. You may disagree, but what does your heart say? And this is actually what wisdom eventually comes down to. Now is the most important time, the one in front of you is the most important thing. And the most important thing to do is to care. 
And that's why we make compassion the most important part you know, of Buddhism. Wisdom, compassion, both going together. And the sign of wisdom is how much you can care. Not how much you know, but how sensitive you are to the people around you. How sensitive you are to the relationship you have with the events of life. How much can you care? It's what real wisdom is, it's how it manifests. Not in knowledge, not in being able to write books, not in being able to explain the most deepest points of metaphysics, but how much you can actually care. And it's not just caring for others, it's caring for yourself. It's not just caring for yourself, it's caring about life. You can't change life. But my goodness, you can care. You can't stop people from dying. But you can care about them in their last days. As I said last week, the job of a doctor, of a psychologist, a nurse, is not to cure the patient, but to care for them. The job of a wife, a husband, is not to cure your partner of all their stupid things. It's to care for them. And the job of you, is not to sort of change all your stupid idiosyncrasies. That my job is not to stop telling stupid jokes. I can't stop that. <laughs> my job is to care. <laughs> and today's stupid joke is about the two men who were, who were talking to one another and one of them said, you know I think I need a pet, I'm going to buy a dog. I'm going to buy a Labrador. And his mate said, buy a Labrador, don't be stupid. Haven't you noticed that owners of Labradors usually go blind? <laughs> so, so that's today's stupid joke. Now look, I can't help myself. You know, it's just my condition. <laughs> so what wisdom is, is not trying to change people, but caring for them. Not trying to change life, but caring for life. Not trying to even change the world, but caring for this world. And there's a huge difference there. Trying to make the perfect, make the world perfect, is actually hating the world as it is. Trying to make yourself perfect, is hating yourself as you are. Caring, is embracing you as you are. That is wisdom. It lies in the relationships we have with people. And the reason why we don't see things as they truly are, the way we, we don't see things as they are, number one, we rely too much on knowledge, we rely too much on what we've been told, we rely too much on sort of received wisdom, we don't do the work to think for ourselves, to investigate for ourselves. That's why hopefully you get challenged when you come in here. You're left with work to do, you don't have someone do the homework for you, that you have to go back and meditate and see these things. And you know you found wisdom you know, if you're a caring person, if you're at peace with yourself. Because when you care, that's where you find the peace. You care for this world, you care for yourself, you care for the relationships you have with other people. Then you find you have peace. So from care comes wisdom, from wisdom comes peace. And you should know that by now. Every time you meditate, and you care for every moment. There, you understand, this is peaceful, you have the understanding, the wisdom, that this is the path to freedom, the path to real peace. So that's what wisdom is, and it's a stupidity, it's just, you know, just like the professor, we have the full cup. Empty the cup. Be still, see things, feel things, rather than knowing things, and then you'll be wise. Not like the professor, but by the happy old monk. So that's the talk this evening on stupidity and wisdom. So now, any questions? Who wants to be intelligent in your next life? <laughs> Very good.
Okay, this is uh, the idea of uh, respect in some religions. You're not supposed to question your teachers as if they are some sort of gods. And that, to me, if you don't question, that is disrespect. It's disrespect to the teachings, it's disrespect to the Dhamma, it's disrespectful to truth. So when we're talking about respect, it's actually what are we truly respecting? And what are we disrespecting? And this comes, it's wonderful, like being a Westerner, actually you come to a teaching like Buddhism afresh, without any cultural baggage. So you have got that empty cup, so you can actually see much clearer. Uh, there's an old story, what was it, about the frog who was so close to the lotus he could never smell it because he was used to it. And someone came afresh and they could, they could savor the beautiful scent of the lotus because they, were, they didn't grow up with it. And it's the same sometimes when we're too close to things, we can't really appreciate it and see it. But what are you truly respecting? You should be respecting truth more than any person. And respecting sort of compassion and kindness more than any sort of rituals. Which is why, you know, here, uh, even today, look, I'm not going to criticize anyone, I'm, I'm actually praising you. There's many people who are now pointing their feet at the Buddha. In a Thai monastery, you want, no, carry on, point, point. In a, in, in a Thai monastery, you would not be allowed to do that. Because they say that's disrespectful to a Buddha. I'm saying that's disrespectful to people because they got bad legs and the Buddha would not mind that at all. He was a compassionate person. So, compassion trumps ritual. So respect, compassion. Respect, no, come on, point. <laughs> it's truth and that's one of the things which is really important. What is important in, in religion? What is important in the spiritual path? And respect that which is really important. What's not important? Forget about that. One well, of the nice things now for each one of you, you can actually go back to that original form of Buddhism. You find what respect truly is. One of the stories which uh, was wonderful, that I was told as a, as a monk, that look, now you're a monk, this was in Thailand, you have to sit higher and you are sort of higher in society than everybody else, even kings would have to bow to you. But then I read in this uh, story of the, one of the wisest monks next to the Buddha, Venal Sariputta. He was walking on arms round, and a little novice, this little squeak of a novice, so sort of came up to him and said, you're badly dressed. Now usually, that would be a no-no. You can't sort of tell these very high monks and criticize them they're badly dressed. But the wisest monk next to the Buddha had a look and said, my goodness, you're right. He went behind a bush, he adjusted his robe, and he came out afterwards, and he put his hands up and he called this little novice teacher. And that type of humility was something which I thought was very beautiful, which was there in the original Buddhism, which you don't see so much in the, uh, the traditional Buddhists of our modern day. But now and again you do see it. You would see that with an Ajahn Chah. Total humble, he'd respect truth more than any hierarchy. And I think that's important, because I was there in China for nine years, I saw that. There were some monks, it doesn't matter, you know, if they've done something wrong, I'm senior, you can't tell me. And of course, you know what happens when we have hierarchies more important than truth. We have all the problems which, you know, in the West we know from the Catholic Church, there's many wonderful people in that Catholic Church, but the hierarchy is strangling it. And in other churches as well. Please, don't ever let that happen to Buddhism. Respect truth more than anything else. Respect compassion. At least that's what I say. Yeah. Intuition is part of wisdom. Because what is intuition? Which you feel the moment. You feel what needs to be done. And please you can trust that. And it's not just female intuition. Men have intuition as well. This is... Um, an example of that, an example of wisdom. Some years ago, people came up and asked this very difficult question for Buddhism in the West. I've got a dog, I've got a cat, it's ill, 
the vet said I should put it down, should I, should I not? I'm supposed to not kill any living beings, you know, that's a very famous precept of a Buddhist. Buddhist. But I'm supposed to be kind and compassionate to these animals, they're in pain. What should I do? And, you know, to me as a monk, it's very clear what to do, you know, the wisdom was very clear. All these, what you're supposed to do, put that aside and feel the situation. To me it was very clear, it's not my task to tell a dog or a cat whether it should die or not die. It's a cat's choice, it's a dog's choice. So I asked, told people, ask the cat, ask the dog what it wants to do. And that's not a stupid question. Many times people have done this, they've taken their dog and cat aside in the vet surgery and they just spent a few minutes with it. Do you really want to die or do you want to carry on? And they've done that and sometimes they've intuited the answer. The dog actually doesn't want to die yet. Sometimes they cat, they look at it and they feel, no, it's had enough. And so when you tell the vet, it's not your decision, the cat wants to die, the dog wants to live. We've had some great examples of that. Was Judy, was, she's here somewhere, I saw her earlier today. Judy was telling me that she did that with her dog. She went to the vet and the vet, he had a cancer. And the vet said, your dog's in such great pain, I've got to put it down. And she took it aside. And as she took it aside, she uh, felt the dog didn't want to go. So she told the vet, now I'm taking it home. And the vet was very angry at her. So you Buddhists are very cruel, you're heartless. You know, you're supposed to be compassionate. The dog's in great pain and you're you know, keeping it alive. You cruel person. But good on her, she sort of took it home. Six months later, she took the dog back to the vet who made a full recovery. And the vet said something like, you Buddhists are very wise. <laughs> That's right, wasn't it Judy? Are oh, you over there, yeah, something like that. But it made a full recovery. So you know, this is what intuition is. You, if that's your dog, your cat, and you've been with it for such a long time, you love it. Intuition is very easy. It's the same if you know, that's your mum or your dad in a coma in the ICU. And the doctors say, should we? turn off the ventilator? Should we turn off all the life support? Is that someone you love very much? Just ask them and you'll know. That's why that intuition, when your mind is silent, when it's free from fear, then you can actually hear. And that's wisdom. Does that answer the question? Very good. Okay, afterwards, we, we're finishing off now, so we'll pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we'll finish off. <laughs>